If you're watching this video, then that's because you're in ninth grade and a student at James Valley Christian School who is enrolled in the Christian Worldview Bible class. I'm Mr. Borchard, and I'm going to be taking you on a journey here through our textbook and teaching you some things that I think are pretty cool. I've got here on my other screen a, uh, the agenda for day number 26. I want you to have that up as well because we're going to go through it and make sure that everything is well understood and that you are feeling prepped and ready to go, pal. All right, uh, I've got this up here, the day number 26 agenda. We're still talking about the Christian worldview of history. Um, and in a few brief moments, I'm going to have you pause the video to make sure that you go do your, your Heidelberg Catechism day number five devotional. Um, and also after that, we'll go into a PowerPoint lecture together. Don't forget that you need to do your vocab quiz. Okay, You need to have that done. Um, that's uh, listed there as a document for you to download in the documents section. Um, but don't forget to look at the video on how to submit your videos. Uh, that'll be important for you, okay? Next thing is uh, you have another assignment due today. It's called the Purpose and Plan Exercise. You should have that done by now. Coming up, we have a historical figure presentation. It's due in three classes. That's on page 253. You'll read the instructions, complete the assignment, and turn it in. It won't actually be a presentation. Um, because here we are. Um, don't forget that you're also completing the discussion questions as you read the textbook, but you should be done with all the reading by now, which means you should technically be done with the discussion questions. However, they're not due until the day of the test, which won't be for four more, four more classes, okay? So, go ahead and pause the video now and complete the devotional if you have not already. And I'll just be chilling out here waiting for you to do that. Okay, if you're back, then that means... Yeah, that means that you have finished the Heidelberg Catechism. And now, you're going to pull up your PowerPoint. I've got the PowerPoint here as well. We're going to go through it together slide by slide and make sure that everything is understood. Don't forget that if you ever have any questions about assignments or homework or lecture, you can send me a pass note or an email, okay? Don't forget that part. Um, all right, let's turn to slide two of our PowerPoint. This slide is called Evidence from Archaeology. First things first, you're going to pause this video, pull up the video linked in this PowerPoint, and then come back to this video to continue the lecture, okay? So go ahead and do that. I'll give you a few moments to pause and do so. Okay, you should have minute, finished that 20, 25 minute video or so. And here we are now talking about archaeology. If you'll remember from last class, we talked about the internal evidence of the Bible. Okay, that is the Bible showing itself to be true by evidences within it. Now we're talking about the historicity, meaning the historical reliability of the Bible as seen from evidence outside of it. Okay, so that's what we call external evidence. And archaeology is one example of external evidence. You've just watched that video, so you have seen that in so many ways, the Bible is historically reliable. The content that it gives is being proven so many times throughout history as being true and accurate. Um, so, we've got a few awesome examples of archaeological find, finds. We've got one example here is Peter's house which is mentioned in Mark chapter 1, verse 29, and Luke chapter 7, verse 44. Go ahead and pause the video now and read those if you don't have your Bible up. Um, also take this time to quickly read the block quote from page 244. I'm going to pull out my book. Let's just read it together. Why not? Oop, wrong book. This block quote here, on page 244, 
says, uh, Many have taken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Um, so Peter's house mentioned in Mark 1.29 and Luke 7.44 has been discovered. It's been found. It's been found. Another thing, another little historical archaeological evidence is uh, about Pontius Pilate. For a long time, people were doubting the authenticity, the historicity of the Bible, saying that it's so strange that there is no mention of Pontius Pilate in any of the other historical documentation until it was discovered. Uh, it was mentioned in a death, uh, it, it, was, it was found to be that he was a real guy. It did actually mention Pontius Pilate. Um, let's look at page 245. There's a block quote there. I'll read, it. I'll read it for you. During the smoldering summer of 1961, some Italian archaeologists were excavating an ancient theater in, at Caesarea, the Mediterranean port that served as the Roman capital of Palestine. When they unearthed a two-by-three-foot stone that bore some kind of inscription, Antonio Frova, who was in charge of the dig, cleaned out the lettering with a, a brush and suddenly his eyes widened in disbelief while his face was cut by a vast grin. The left of the third inscription had been chipped away, but Frova reconstructed it in short. Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has presented the Tiberium to the Caesareans. And uh, this little mention of Pontius Pilate gives incredible uh, credence to the accounts of the Bible. So cool, so cool. Let's look at the next slide here, slide number three, titled The Resurrection of Jesus. <sighs> Here's what we got to understand here. If the resurrection of Jesus did not happen, then there is no reason for you or for I to be a Christian. The entirety of our faith circles around the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus... Uh, did not, well, we'll get to that. Uh, but Christianity will stand or fall on the resurrection of Jesus. And it's such a major event that it separates Christianity from any other religion in the world. Um, so here are some facts around Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, his death was predicted in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Pause the video, look it up. Um, and Jesus was actually medically documented as dead. He was pierced in the side by the Roman soldier. And after he was pierced, there was a release of fluids from Jesus' body, which indicates that he had been dead for some time. That tells us that he has been dead for quite a while. Um, the next thing was Jesus' body was sealed in a guarded tomb. And another thing is many people actually met with the resurrected Jesus. Go ahead and read John chapter 20, verses 16 through 18. Um, the thing about the resurrection of Jesus is uh, if we did not have that, then we would not have anything else. If Jesus did not resurrect, then that would mean he was just a human. If he died and does not resurrect, then he did not pay the penalty of our sins. Uh, and that's what it's all about. If, we, if he did not pay the penalty of our sins, then we are still held liable. We are not justified. We are not saved from that condemnation. And if Jesus did, did not actually resurrect, then he was not God, um, which is another big, would be another big issue. Last slide here, slide number four, is titled History with a Purpose. I need you to understand, and I want you to know. I can't make you believe, but I can at least tell you that God has a plan and God has a purpose for 
your life. And your life uh, is an important piece in the grander and the bigger picture of human history. Every moment in your life is charged with a purpose as God has directed and flowed all of history and He has given meaning to every moment and every person in every moment. All of history has a purpose, including you in your part in Huron, South Dakota as a ninth grade student. All right, class. Thank you so much for joining with me and uh, going through part three of our Light Bearers textbook. Let me pray for you now, and uh, you can continue on doing whatever else it is that you need to do for my class or for other classes. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all you do for us. I thank you for my students. I pray that you would sharpen their minds. Father, I pray that you would sharpen my mind. I pray that you would continue to make me a better educator and a better teacher and find even better ways to bring this content home in a way that matters to these students. So, uh, Father, as they go about the rest of their day, I pray that they are dwelling on you and that they are understanding who they are in your sight as, as your child. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.